So I was saying, let's jump into this session. This is an introduction to Motoko. We will talk about what is Motoko, how we can build and write the code for canisters on the internet computer, how we can set up the environment. Uh, we will talk about defix. We will talk about candid, candid UI, functions, variables, and types in Motoko. So this is a one hour session. It's recorded and this is very important. It's like the basis of Motoko. If you need to watch only one session this week, this is the one. So uh, keep the eyes and the and your ears very very open. If you ask if you have questions, Q and A. We will be doing ten minutes of Q and A at the end of this session. So you should be able to see my screen, and I have the minimum setup for building a canister in Motoko. The minimum setup consists of two files, which is main.emo. This is, of course, a Motoko file. .emo is a Motoko file. And the second file that we will need is a dfx.json file. This is a configuration file for dfx. And dfx is a tool. So if I go here and I do dfx version, for example, this is a tool that I've already installed on my machine. And I have version 0.15.1. I think the latest right now is 0.15.2. DFX is useful for building code, compiling code, and deploying canisters on the internet computer and also managing them. Before we start, what is Motoko? So Motoko is a new programming language. And I can actually show you maybe. This is our repository, and we actually have some chapters. The level, the chapter one, it's in lesson chapter one. What is a canister and WebAssembly and Motoko? So that's here. Motoko is a new language that has been created by the Definity Foundation. So the Definity Foundation is the foundation that has created the Internet Computer Protocol. And it's a programming language designed for creating dApps, so decentralized application. Motoko compiles to WebAssembly. So WebAssembly is this, looks like this. It's a virtual environment. Just like on Solidity, you have the EVM environment, the EVM virtual, the Ethereum virtual machine. On the internet computer, the virtual machine is WebAssembly. So WebAssembly is actually a really interesting technology. If you are not familiar with it, I strongly recommend you watch. There are some really good videos on YouTube about WebAssembly, like 10 minute videos. WebAssembly is going to be a huge thing in the future. It's a standard for essentially running code in multiple environments. So you can run WebAssembly in your browser. You can run it on the cloud. Uh, for instance, on the internet computer, on smart devices, and all sorts of virtual machine. Essentially, it's kind of the ultimate virtual machine because it supports a lot of languages. So C, C++, Rust, Motoko, and many more languages in the future. And also, WebAssembly run on any device. So the image that I've created here to, you know, make it clear what, what is the purpose of WebAssembly. It's the solving this problem, which has been painful for developers for the past 40 years, um, which is that you need different source code if you're trying to run an application on different platforms. So you know we have different standards like x86, x64. Uh, now with the MacBook and the mobile devices, we even have a, a new standard, which is a, a REM. And so all those chipsets, they require a different source code. So that's three code base that you have to work on. Uh, and even more if you, have, if you are supporting different uh, OS and different platforms. With WebAssembly, you just write your source code once and you just compile it to a WebAssembly module and that's running everywhere. So that's a super cool standard. And also WebAssembly has a lot of advantages, like it's, it's really fast. Uh, because it's very, very low level. It's optimized for speed and performances. So you can run like complex application in your browser, like games, simulations, all sorts of things. 
and it's a secure environment. Um, it doesn't mean that you cannot create code that is not secure, but it has a, a concept of module and modules can only as access specific resource in WebAssembly. It has been built with security in mind, which is super important for something like uh, blockchain, for example, where we have a lot of money, uh, uh, financial applications. We don't want to, you know, we don't want to have a unsafe environment. But no one, no one sane would write WebAssembly because it's a low level language and you don't want to write WebAssembly. If you are curious, you can check it out. Um, there is actually one, I think it's the only one example in the Motoko, um, sorry, in the Definity slash example repository. There is one example of a canister written in, uh, in, in WebAssembly. This is this. It looks like this. So if you are curious about WebAssembly, you can take a look. Um, yeah, I don't recommend to, if you are curious, you can take a look. I will put the link in the chat, but essentially it's just uh, for, for the fun. No one would really use that to create scalable applications. And that's why we have Motoko. So we write our source code in Motoko, we compile that to WebAssembly, and then this is what will be installed on the canister. A fun fact, uh, Motoko was created by Andreas Rosberg. Who also who is also one of the brain and the mind behind WebAssembly. So the idea is that Motoko was created for WebAssembly uh, in mind. And that's why it's so so cool and so so powerful as well. So a file with uh, the extension .mo is a Motoko file. So oops, sorry. That it looks like this, uh, and Motoko is a high level language. Let's go. So the first thing that you want to do with a Motoko file is always start with the actor key, uh, keyword and then open brackets. And that's where we will write our functions because a canister, so this is the code for a canister, is an actor. And if you don't know what is an actor, you can take a look at this article. I think it's on Wikipedia. It explains the actor model. It's a theory in computer science. Essentially, it's just uh, saying that each canister has a private state and you can only reach the private state of a canister like through messages. So the memory of canister A is not accessible directly by canister B and they have to send messages to each other to communicate. And that's how you build applications on the internet computer. You create canisters and you make those canisters communicate with each other. So I'll be also sending this link. keeping track of all the links we are using today. Okay. Then Motoko is a typed language. So statically typed language, which means that every variable and every function will have a type and you have to respect this type. Let counter of type not is equal to zero. This is how you would initialize a variable in Motoko. This is an immutable variable, so we can never change it, which is maybe not a good idea for a counter. That's why probably you would use var at the except of let. Then here I'm specifying the type. I could also define my variable like this. There wouldn't be any problem. Um, but I like and I recommend you do the same for the whole week of the bootcamp that you always use the, the type, that you specify manually the type of each variable you declare. This way you will uh, keep in mind that, okay, every variable I'm using, there is a type associated with it and you don't mix it up. Okay, then let's create our first function. And so we want to make the function public, which means we can access it from outside of the canister. And we want to increase the counter. So I take no arguments, I return nothing, and I will just do counter is equal to counter plus one. And then I return. Uh, okay. 
And then I will create a query function, get counter. Oops, this is not the correct syntax, by the way. Um, I will, uh, I just want to, I will disable completion for just for this session. So as you can see, um, even the types need to be specified in the functions. So here we are returning the counter. And so counter is of type not. And so that's why I need to specify asynchronous not. If you are not familiar with asynchronous, it's uh, the same as you can have in JavaScript, you know, async awaits or in other programming languages. Essentially, it's just saying that when you call a public function, you need to wait a little bit. What you will receive is a promise that you will receive an answer later. Because when you call a function, you are not sure that you will receive the answer, you know, instant, instantaneously. Um, so that's why you need the, this async. Every public function returns async something. Okay, so now that we have our canister and it's a really basic one and I will add more, more functions later, but let's try to deploy it. And so to do that, we have three places we can deploy. We have locally, we have the playgrounds, and we have the internet computer mainnet. Let's start locally. And to start locally, I will start a replica on my machine. To do that, I will run fx start. And I recommend to add the clean flag, so uh, hyphen hyphen clean, and this will start a replica. Okay, I have an issue, failed to load the FX configuration. Apparently, there is nothing in my dfx.json. And that's on purpose. If you want to use a dfx, you need to have a dfx.json file. And so this is how you create one. So you can take a look, um, for example, let's say, if you take a look at the main repository, of the week, the DAO adventure, you will see that I've already created the fx.json for you. And so this is how you would create one. So it's a JSON file, uh, JavaScript, JavaScript uh, notation. And so we have essentially a list of canisters. So you can see canisters and then opening the brackets and then all the canisters of the main repository. So level one, level two, level three, level four and five. So for for our um, application of today, we only have one and we will call it first canister. And we need to specify two things. The main, uh, the, which is the entry point for the Motoko compiler. And so to do that, I mean, we only have one file, so we need to specify main.mo and then the type of the canister, which is Motoko. Then we are not using any package manager for today. We are just using uh, raw Motoko. We don't have any imports, so I will remove that, which should remove this issue. And now I can try again. And this is working. So it's running a local replica, and we have the dashboard, so we can take a look at it. Internet computer replica dashboard, subnet replica version, uh, canisters, and everything. What we see here is a copy of the internet computer, so the you know this this network that is running on our machine. Of course, it's not the real network; it's just so you can deploy things locally, and you don't have to pay for it, and you can try things. Now we have just started the replica. And you need to have always a terminal that is dedicated to your replica. So you have to essentially open a new one, like this one for my replica and this one for the rest of my actions. And now we can deploy our canister. And to deploy a canister, you need to run dfx deploy, the name of the canister, first canister in this case. And then there are more options, like if you deploy on the mainnet, on the playground, you need to add some options. But if you are deploying locally, it's only like this. 
the first time you deploy a canister, it will create a wallet. So a wallet is essentially, um, it's a way for you to have cycles. And I will explain what are cycles exactly, but it, those are like credits that you need to have to, have to deploy canisters. Then it's creating a canister for you. So you receive an ID. This is the canister ID that I have. Then it's building the code and installing the code in the canister. And I can show you. Now we have a cache folder. So those, this folder has been created for us. And this is where you will see the WebAssembly module I was talking about. Oops. If you take, take a look here, we have the WebAssembly module. We cannot say, uh, we cannot see much like there, there is nothing. If you want to see something, you need to click here. Save as a WebAssembly text file. So it will create dot what, and then you can try to look into it. Uh, but it's, yeah, this is essentially very, very hard to read that. And we don't really need that, but I just, I just wanted to show you. So this is what is actually installed. Then installing the, the code and then it's deploying it and you have this link which you can click on it which is the candid UI and the candid interface and this is a virtual um no it's it's um auto generated visual interface for your application and so every time you deploy a canister you will also have this interface created for you and we can interact with our canister from this place so I can get the counter so this is zero right now and I can increase it. So up and then, okay, one, I can try again. And two, and that's it. And so if I share this link with you and I won't do it, you are not able to access my canister because this is a local canister. And so it only exists on my machine. I would be able to share it if I, if I added some like way for you to reach out to my machine, but we won't do that today. So this is only running locally. Now I want to talk about the difference between let and var. And I've already talked about that uh, before, but just to make things clear, we have two types of variables in Motoko. So this is a mutable variable declared with bar. And this is an immutable variable. And so if I try to use this, you will see that it will throw an error because Let's see, expected mutable assignment target, and it's not mutable. So as you can see, when you use an immutable variable like this one, you can never change the value of this variable. So why would you do that? Because sometimes you have variables that you just want to store, but you don't need to change it. For example, maybe I want to store creator name. I want to store who, who created this canister, and I will just store my name, and then I can use that uh, here, for example, I create a query function, I get creator name, and it returns a text, which is the name of the creator. Oops. Okay, now I can deploy again. Why not use const? Uh, I don't know, that's just a choice they've made. Uh, so it's, yeah, it represents a const essentially. And now I return my name, so this is nice. Okay, now the difference between this function and this function is very important. Update function can change the state goes through consensus. This is what we call an update function. And so an update function is a function that is able to change 
the state and the state is actually actually the state change is retained and so when we want to change the state of a canister we have to go through consensus because the internet computer is built on top of a blockchain and so we need to go through consensus to actually change the state of a canister for example here we are changing the state of this variable and so we need to go through consensus and that's why you will see this takes around two seconds yeah two seconds whereas this i just immediate like it takes a few milliseconds and that's very very fast because this is an update function and this is a query function and so query function cannot change the state read only doesn't go through consensus takes around, it depends, 100 to 200 milliseconds. Okay, so now let's make things a bit more interesting and we will change the place, the network we deploy. We will deploy on the playground. As you can see, it's creating a canister ID. And this time we can see that the link is different. Uh, if we go back here, we can see that it's 127.001, which is, uh, well, essentially your local host. So this is local, but this is not local. As you can see, canister ID dot row dot ICP zero dot IO. So this link, actually you, also you, you should be able to access it. So I can send it in the chat. You should be able to click and call my methods. So for example, you can increase the counter if you want. And I'm sure that if multiple people do it at the same time, we will see like, I don't know, right now it's just one, but uh, yeah, should be able to see. Maybe someone will do it. I'm waiting. Okay, yeah. <laughs> so someone clicked. Someone else, we are at four now. And yeah, that's that's what I wanted to show you. So what is the playground? I received this question a lot. The playground is on the mainnet. Like the thing is that on most other chains, you will have the concept of a test net, but on ICP, it's actually really hard to make a test net because there are a lot of machines like the nodes and it's really hard to replicate how communication between nodes work, how the subnets, like how things are defined. It's really, really hard. And it's not also the best experience for developers because there are also like canisters that live on the mainnet. For example, you know, the ICP token is actually a, a canister on the internet computer. There is the governance canister, uh, the NNS, like, all those canisters are living on mainnet. And if you want to interact with them, you need to be on the mainnet. And that's why the playground has been created. It's a place where you can deploy for free. So kind of like a test net, but you can actually, it's, it's actually part of the internet computer. Like it's, it's a, the real network. The main difference is that when you deploy on the playground, your canister has a time limited lifetime. So after 20 minutes, this canister will be destroyed. And also you have a few limitations. For example, you cannot uh, you cannot transfer cycles to other canisters, of course, because otherwise you would be able to empty the playground. So cycles are credits and credits that is needed for running applications on the internet computer. When you deploy on the playground, it's completely free, but you have those limitations. So we've seen that we can deploy locally, we can deploy on the playgrounds. Finally, we can deploy on the mainnet but not on the playground. If you want to do that, you need to do dfx deploy, hyphen hyphen network IC, and then the name of the canister. This costs money, so around $1. And if you don't have a cycle wallet set up, you won't be able to do that. And so now, 
but let me see. Yeah, it has created a canister. And so when you deploy on the mainnets, not the playground, but you know the rest of the mainnets, you will see this file, which is automatically generated for you, canister IDs.json. This is your canister, and this is the ID of it. But this one is really forever. Like, I mean, except if I delete it, it's forever on the mainnet. And so I have a link, as always, the candid UI. And we can, again, see all the functions that we have. So increase counter and get counter and so on. Now I want to show you a few things about DFX. So what is possible to do with DFX and why do we need it? So DFX, if you need help, you can run this command, DFX help. And you can see all the things you can do with DFX. So it's the Definity SDK. So it's the SDK that you will use to you know build, deploy your canisters. Build, you can do yeah, you can do DFX build, you can do DFX deploy, DFX uh, dependencies, DFX identity, DFX ledger, and so on. If you want to, you know, you are curious about, oh, uh, what is DFX identity used for? Manage identities used to communicate with the IC. Setting an identity enables you to test user base access controls. If I do DFX identity, then there will be, you know, subcommands. And so if I want to see how to use the subcommands, you can all, again do a DFX identity hyphen hyphen link. And then you have all the commands. So DFX identity, deploy wallet, get wallet, uh, get principal, who am I, rename, and so on. DFX identity is really important because every time you are using DFX, you are associating an identity with it. And so we can, for example, see the name. This name, I mean, this is the name for my identity. Makes sense. And then your identity has a principle associated with it. So this is my principle. The principle is der derived from the public key and the private key, the public key. So it's a uh, public information. You can, I mean, there is no problem in using this. Uh, and it's essentially, yeah, a way to, you know, represent your identity when you deploy your canisters and interact with them. So. For example, if I take a look at the Ethernet computer dashboard, which is here, it's a dashboard that contains information about uh, the number of cycles burned per second. So this is representative of the activity on the network, uh, the number of canisters deployed, the number of transactions per second, and so on. You can also search for any canister. And so this is my canister ID over here the one that I've deployed on the mainnet. I can go here and it gives me, well, it gives me, for example, my interface. So you can see the candid UI. Uh, you also have the Motoko like representation of this. Uh, you also have other languages, Rust, JavaScript, TypeScript. So if you want to interact from the front end, you can also use that. And you have the list of controllers. So this is the people that control the canister. A canister can be controlled by one or multiple developers. No one, if you can, if you remove all the controllers, then the canister is essentially like a smart contract on Ethereum. You have no one able to upgrade it or delete it. Or a canister can also be controlled by another canister. And that's why, how you can build a DAO. Um, and I will go into more details in the next sessions. Then you have the subnet, and this is our subnet ID. So this is actually where our canister is deployed. You have multiple subnets on the internet computer. This one, uh, we have a few information. It's storing 200 gigabytes of data. There are 13 nodes in the subnet. There are 1,569 canisters, and that's the activity on this subnet. And then, Oops, where is my, okay, I need to go back. And then we have the module hash, which essentially corresponds to uh, the SHA-256, SHA sorry, SHA-256 of the WebAssembly module of the, sorry, of the hash of the WebAssembly module install, installed on the canister. 
So those are basic information. And you can see that this is the same that we had here. So this is my identity. And this one is, so this is my, if I do defix identity network IC get wallet, this is the same, uh, this is the same identifier. The wallet is not the identity. Why? Because to deploy canisters, we need cycles. And so cycles are credits that are used to pay for computation and storage costs on the internet computer. And for example, if I do, um, let's say, let me see. This is a command to receive information about our canister. Uh, and we don't have the cycle balance. Okay, I wanted to have the cycle balance. Maybe status will do it. Okay, yeah, apparently we have it. Okay, so you can see that my canister has a, a number, something called balance, which corresponds to the number of cycles that are inside the canister. And so three, uh, this is three trillion cycles right now. This is the default value that is sent when I create a canister. You can change it to one trillion or two trillion or even more. This represents around five dollars worth of cycle. And this is what enables the canister to live and to pay for its storage and to pay for its computation. With five dollars, this canister will, I mean, there is not a lot of storage, like it's just a simple variable and probably there won't be a lot of activity here. So this is enough for like storing that almost forever. And what I wanted to touch on is that only your cycle wallet. So uh, where is it? Yeah, we let's do it again. Get wallet. Only another canister is able to store cycles. So you your identity, like your default identity, is not able to store cycles. That's why you need this cycle wallet, which is just a canister that you control. This canister holds your cycles for you and use it to send it to other canisters. OK, so that's about it for the cycles. Um, if you want to add cycles, you can do it from the FX as well. You have a command to top up your canister. Maybe we have some questions already. How long is this lesson? We will have a break. Yeah, the break is only at the end of the week. <laughs> okay, I can see that we have some Q&A. Motoko code is compiled to WebAssembly. Yes, that's correct. What is a boundary nodes? Boundary nodes. Yes, so someone has seen on the dashboard that we have this concept of boundary nodes here. So the boundary nodes, and this will be the topic of the day five. We'll talk about that. The boundary nodes are what enables users to access the internet computer. So you have the nodes that actually run the consensus and the one that essentially run those canisters. But those nodes are not accessible directly by users. And users go through boundary nodes, and then boundary nodes connect to the consensus nodes. Actually, boundary nodes are super important for a lot of reasons, like, for example, rate limiting. If someone is trying to attack the internet computer, like sending a lot of requests, the boundary nodes will make sure that if it's coming from the same identity, that we limit the rate. So it's um, a protection layer. Also, it translates HTTP requests to actual ICP request because consensus nodes, they don't have a HTTP gateway. They don't ans like answer directly. So for example, when you access this web page, like the Candid UI, which is built on the internet computer, uh, not this one because this one is locally, but this one, what we are doing here is sending an HTTP request, right? And so we need a, those boundary nodes to be able to translate that to an actual ICP request. And also they do like many, many things. So they do cache, for example, um, 
which makes it faster to access websites on the internet computer. And those are, right now, they are all uh, deployed by Definity. But next year, around Q1, anyone will be able to run a boundary node. And anyone that runs a boundary node will be rewarded for that with ICP tokens. The idea is that a boundary node is really, really light to run. The consensus nodes are not because they run a lot of data. They run complex calculation. So there is a cost to it. The boundary nodes, they just, you know, they just like do a little bit of caching and also route the request. So it's not the same. And actually, I think you should be able to run a boundary node from like a server that you have at home or maybe even a Raspberry Pi. And so this is going to be open to anyone. Right now, it's not because of some technical limitation, but this is in the roadmap for Q1 2024. Okay, let's go back to Motoko. Um, so right now we haven't imported any, you know, anything. We have just worked with the base of the language. But of course, you will want to work with modules. So modules are pieces of code that someone else has written in Motoko and you want to use it for your own purpose. And so there is this concept of the base library. which is here, let me, yeah. I will share that in the chat as well. So this, those are the lists of modules that we could import. For example, let's say NAT. And those are the list of functions that we have in the module. So for example, we have NAT to text. This takes a NAT and it returns the textual representation. Let's try it out. So if you want to import a module, you need to do it like this. Import NAT, MO base slash NAT. Would be, if we import text, it would be import text, MO base slash text. This is how you import, uh, but this works, this syntax only works for the base library. And the base library is everything that is here. Those are like, oh, yeah, let's go back. All those modules are from the base library. So you have array, uh, character, buffer, Boolean, all sorts of types. Let's import that. And then maybe we want to create a function public query function, get the counter as text. Instead of returning the counter as a natural value, we want to return it as a nat. And so we could do nat dot two text of the counter. And that should work. When you deploy a canister for the first time, you will pay for the deployment, the initial deployments. But then I've seen a lot of people worry about the cost, like, oh, what if I deploy again? And like, how am I going to pay? You don't pay for like further deployments, like only the first time, but this is costing nothing. Like, I don't recommend to do it because it's not clean. You should probably test first locally and then when you're ready, deploy on mainnet. But I had instances where I deployed like a canister like 100 times on the mainnet just because I didn't want to work locally. And this cost absolutely nothing. Like, uh, don't worry about deploying multiple times. And if you're worried, you can always check your cycle balance with the dfx command. Okay, so I have updated my canister. And as you can see, when you upgrade the canister, the value of the, like the state is always lost. So if you remember, we had previously increased the counter to, I think at some point it was like one or two or something like this. But because we've upgraded our canister, now we are at zero and we can increase. This time it will be retained. So one, and that's it, it works. But when you deploy again, you lose your state. 
and we, we will talk, we will see how we can prevent that. There are ways to there are, there is something called stable memory which enables you to not lose the state of your canister when you upgrade it. But by default, everything that is declared, every variable, is reset to the original value. And let's try our function, get counter as text, and this is one, but as a textual value. So if you want to learn more about the modules that you can use, you have, uh, where is not yet? Yeah. All the documentation is here. And you can see that it explains what is a NAT. So a NAT is actually a special type in Motoko because contrary to most other programming languages, NATs are inf infinite numbers, like they are unbounded. So you can never overflow with a NAT. The underlying memory representation will grow as the NATs grow. It's not necessarily the most efficient, but it's so well optimized that I recommend actually to use NAT. You have other like natural numbers, like you have NAT8, NAT16, NAT32, and NAT64, but actually I very, very uh, rarely use them because except for like binary operations, I won't use them because the memory, like the optimization of the NAT is really, really good. So. I just use NAT and I don't have to worry about is my NAT going to overflow or not. And here you can take a look. You have a lot of uh, functions like NAT.equal, uh, NAT.less, um, and add, sub. Of course, you can do like public func add to counter, and we will take a NAT and just add this NAT to the counter. You don't need to do, uh, oops. You could do this, like, where is this? Yeah, we could do that. Counter is equal to nuts dot add of counter and uh, n a variable. But you can also do that. I mean, that's the same syntax. And we can check that we have, yeah, it's here. Uh, at the counter, we will maybe add 10. As you can see, uh, the value of the counter has been reset once again. And we are now at 10. Yeah. Otherwise, we would have been at uh, 11, I think. Okay. So I think I've touched upon everything I wanted to touch upon for the first lesson. And there are more types that we haven't talked about, but we will talk about them in the next sessions. Like, for example, you have the type Boolean, which represents true or false. You have um, the type array, which you will use like this. So this is an array of natural number, for example, like one, two, I think it's like this. Yeah. Uh, no, maybe it's like this. Yep. Uh, you have other types. For example, for the level one, you will need to use the type buffer. I can already spoil you a bit. For the level one, you need to get familiar with this type, which is called buffer. It's actually a class. And so that's how you will define a buffer. Um, you will need to import the buffer module from the buffer base library and then create a buffer like this. Let buffer is equal buffer dot buffer. I know it sounds like a strange syntax the first time you see that, but actually it's make, it makes a lot of sense. What it means is that you are importing the class buffer from the buffer module. So this is 
for the module and this is for the class. And then you need to specify what is inside the buffer. So for those of you that are not familiar with a buffer is you can think of it as a, just a, um, somewhere where you can add things, like you can add values, kind of like an array that would grow. And so, for example, in this case, we want to have a buffer of natural number. And so we would specify buffer dot buffer, and then the type inside the buffer. And this is the initial capacity. So you could set zero. It will automatically grow as you add values. If you wanted to store text, you would do this. If you wanted to store Boolean, you would store this like this, um, and so on. Now, let me answer the question. I've seen a few questions in the chat. So uh, we have answered about the boundary nodes already. Oh. Hey, yeah. Arian, you can, uh, Arian, I don't know if it's Arian or Arian. Srivatsva, sorry for the pronunciation. You can, uh, you can talk. You have a question? You are muted just in case. No, it's all right. Okay. Uh, sorry. Motoko code is compiled to WebAssembly. I am using Canad CanDB. Okay. Uh, if you are using CanDB, this is not a question for today. This is something more advanced. This is an introduction session, so I will only take like introductory questions. How could I pass a wasm to the blob? Uh, this is also a very advanced question. I mean, not so advanced, but yeah, today it's just uh, about Motoko. When I deploy via DFX deploy, I see I'm spending cycles from my wallet linked to my DFX identity. Yeah, that's correct. How can I swap ICP for cycles then? There is a really good tutorial, which is here. Uh, set up. Where is this? Why is it not here? Okay, yeah. You have all the inf information about cycles. Uh, so it, it takes some time to set up your cycle wallet. So I won't be doing it in this introductory sessions, but I will send the link in the chat. You can get free cycles from the cycle faucets. So you have the tutorial here on how to do it. Um, just one thing, if you are trying to get cycles, if you're trying to get cycles, don't do it from the Git pod environments. Like, don't do it from here because the identity that you will have if you're using Git pod, as I've as I've shown in the introductory session, like here. Um, this is something online and it's not like local to your machine. So make sure that you are not doing that. If you want to have cycles, you need to set up the FX locally. So for that, you need to follow this, installing the SDK. Um, and yeah, then you can get the cycles. You can also convert ICP tokens. Everything is explained here. How can I estimate the cycle costs of my public functions? Good questions. Um, so the costs. Uh, it's here, yeah. There is a dedicated page. Also, I'm sending the link in the chat, which is about cycle costs. And it's really, really precise. Like everything is measured in terms of WebAssembly instructions. So you will pay for every line of code that is executed. 
and you can actually see the cost here and you can calculate how much it's going to cost and everything. This will take a long time. Like if you're using this, it will take a long time before you actually reach a value because it's so like precise that you have to take into account many, many things. Also, you have the cost for like storage and everything. But there is another thing called a uh, counter, like a performance counter. So this is advanced, but um, I think it's in the Motoko base library here. Okay, this is here. So this is the module called Experimental Internet Computer. This is a experimental a module, of course. And you can use count instructions. It will count how much instructions are computed, um, computed when you call a function. And with this value, you can cost like you can you can calculate how much cycles will be spent. Another way which I really like to use, it's this one, experimental cycles it will give you the balance of your canister and you can actually uh, use that, then call your function and then check your cycle balance. And it will give you approximately how much cycles have been spent. There is one thing about that, which is, it's really easy to use, but it's not very precise because if you think about it, when you use the cycle balance, you are also always removing cycles, even if it's really, really small number because of the cost of storage. So if you do like balance, then you call your function, then balance, you have this take into account that the cycle spends are spent for your function, but also because of the storage cost. And the storage costs are really, really low for like, you know, just a few seconds, but still they will impact the value. So this is a bit less precise to do that, uh, but I still really like it because it's easy to, to use. Okay, uh, for everyone that is here for other questions, it's not the place. Uh, if it's not a question about Motoko or introduction to Motoko, I won't answer it here. I've seen some, some questions are not related to introductory topics. As a complete beginner, do you have any tips for me to navigate this course? Yes. Uh, so take your time. You don't have to rush because even if you are still level one at the end of the week, it's completely fine. Make sure that you take time to read the repository. So, you know, we have this. And here you have the lessons. If you are an advanced developer, you can probably skip some of them. Like, for example, there is a whole chapter about variables and functions. I mean, if you are an advanced developer, you probably already get it. But if you are new to this and you need more time, I really recommend that you take the time to read that. Um, it's full of information and like it's really for beginners. I've written all those chapters myself and I've really tried to take the perspective of a beginner that starts. And of course, yeah, practice like build the level one, even if it takes time, you have the correction for each level. Don't rush into the correction, really try by yourself because you will run into issues and you will understand like why each issue that you face is like a new thing that you, that you will understand. Okay. And uh, good luck. And also don't hesitate to reach out to your team and on Discord and everything. Can I link NNS to DFX identity? Uh, no, those are separated identities. So right now there is no way to export or import one of the two. I I think it's a problem and uh, it will be solved in the future, but right now it's like you have your DFX identity, you have your NNS identity. It's not the same. How can I estimate? I already answered that. Yeah. Are there any static analysis tools for cost estimation? Uh, I don't think there is right now. No. There is not. Yeah, no, there is not. I just, just making sure. Are cycle costs 
based on current network use. No, that's a good thing. <laughs> that's a really good thing about DIC. Uh, so you have the cycle ICP to cycle rate, which is every minute is uh, updated. Essentially, the the number of cycles that you get does not depend on the price of ICP. For example, if ICP is pumping, like ICP tomorrow is like $50 instead of, I don't know right now, it should be at five or something. Then you will get, um, let me think. Like you will get 10 times more cycles for the same number of ICP uh, because it's always updated. And so it means that you can calculate the cost in dollars, not in ICP. For example, storing one gigabyte for one year on the internet computer cost one, uh, sorry, cost $5. And it doesn't matter if ICP is at uh, $1 or at $1,000, it will not affect the cost of our developers. So that's um, like, that, that's really good, I think, because it's really hard to build like on Ethereum if you your costs are always changing, if the network is being used and so on. So that's a good thing. And uh, yeah. I hope it answers your question. I've done level one. Yep. Nice. Okay. So we are at the we are on time. That was everything for this introductory session. Next session is in two, sorry, in three hours. No, two hours. It's in two hours and we will build the level one together. So this is our first like complex, more complex application. I see you there and uh, good luck to everyone. Don't hesitate to reach out if you have a question. Bye.